to another Uncle Sam has got a chill on podcast. This is the Tank Show, and today, man, we have a special podcast because we have the man. I mean, I'm talking about the real man. All right, Don Man, Steel Team Six, Special Operations Veteran, and New York Times best-selling author, host, and totally unique type of shoot house challenge that we're going to be talking about. Surviving Man, the TV show that I've been telling you about. Well, we have the man on this TV show. We're also going to talk about other different topics. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to start sharing the video far and wide. I want you to go to Apple iTunes. I want you to give me five review. I want you to go to YouTube channel as well. This is the time where you are the backbone of Uncle Sammy's Got a Children's Tribe and start doing your thing. Thank you so much. And no more further ado, I want to uh, have joined Don Man, U.S. Navy SEAL. Thank you so much. An honor and pleasure to have you here on our podcast. Good morning, Tank. It's great to see you again. Yes, sir. Well, thanks for having me as a guest on your show. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, man. Um, man, we got so much to talk about, so much, and I'm super excited to have you. Um, you know, we are, you know, I can tell you, man, uh, and some of the guys, you know, that have been watching, following these, this uh, Surviving Man TV show, last night was amazing, man, amazing. Tell us about that. Tell us, uh, you know, you, you, I, I can talk about it, but you, you know, from your point of view, what, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, Tank, uh, for one, working with you on that show was fantastic. That was a great experience. You made the show even better than what we anticipated. But uh, Surviving Man was basically uh, a concept from Bob Seafell, who is a director and the producer of the show. And he wanted to, have a show where people shot, did PT, did ropes courses, did all these things that we did, but he wanted me to compete against the top person. I said, Bob, there's no way I can compete against the top people there. I'm 63 years old. There's no way. And he said, yes, you can. I see you doing this stuff. So anyways, the show changed that it wasn't a competition. It became a show where we were competing against points, but only because it was part of selection course. And the selection course was to rescue a hostage. And just like SEAL Team or Delta Force or Rangers or anything, you have this some type of a course called selection or whatever you want to call it. But at the end, you're on a team if you make the if you make the grade. And our team was to rescue a hostage. And the reason we had civilians doing this is because the government want total deniability against this hostage they were rescuing. He was a bad guy, but the bad guy had intel and we needed him alive. So we vetted these tough Americans, 32 Americans who had chosen over 500 applicants to come into this made up country and to get some intel, some information, receive a warning order and go in and save a hostage before he was executed. And that, that was the, 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 the basis of the show. Yeah, it was it was, uh, it was a pretty much uh, amazing experience. Uh, amazing people, man. You guys did an excellent, phenomenal job choosing uh, these competitors and their attitude and their personalities. And, um, you know, as a lot of people have been watching the show, man, not none of them quit. None of them gave up. Everybody gave the, the all to, to this, you know, to this uh, in a particular challenge. Why do you think that? What What do you think that was? What, what I mean, out of the other different TV shows, this was very unique to that, right? I think personally, I think it was you and your and, and just the, your persona, man, the, the way that you were leading the whole the whole thing. Uh, people actually just sucked up to, onto that and say, you know, we're, we're not going to quit, right? What do you think about that? Well, thanks, Tank. Uh, you're right. Nobody quit. Nobody quit at all. And we had we had some people in really good shape. And we have some people of mediocre shape and some weren't in good shape, but you're right. None of them quit. And the one thing they all had in common, they had a very, very powerful mindset. And their mindset was, I will just keep moving. Weeks before the show, I would do Zoom calls with all the, the contestants, all the applicants who, who were picked. And I told them, I said, uh, it's going to be really, really difficult. As a matter of fact, my mindset used to be, push yourself until you bleed, hallucinate, or pass out. And I did that on a regular basis for decades. When I was training for a big competition, I would push myself until I would bleed, 
pass out or hallucinate. And I picture a line. And if you go over that line, you know you're not leaving anything at home. You know you're not leaving anything on the table. You're giving it your all. But I've hurt myself quite a few times over the years by pushing too hard for too long. Now what I believe is you have that line. You have to know where that line is. And when you go over the line, you're going to cause harm, maybe to your body, maybe with your relationship, maybe with your wife, or your husband, maybe with something else in your life will stop crumbling. So now I believe you recognize where that line is, go up and touch it, and then come back down, regroup, get your energy together. You have a macro goal or some big challenge or a mission, and now turn it back up, go all the way up, go all the way up, push hard, push hard, push hard until you touch that line, don't go over it, and then back off. Accomplish the mission, accomplish the goal, back off, and then set your sights higher for the next one. And, and I believe the concept works for anybody in any endeavor, and I call those macro goals. A lot of micro goals to reach that big macro goal, and you have to push really hard if your macro goal is set high. And I believe you've got to set your goals high, set them really high. And just have a series of micro goals to reach up, hit that macro goal without pushing too hard, back off, charge up again until you reach the macro goal. That's pretty much how I've been dealing with life for the last 40 years or so. And it that's, worked. That's amazing wisdom right there. And a lot of people need to hear it. Uh, and talking about that, you know, what makes, you know, Don, man, and I think that I, I wanted to bring this up sooner, but where, where, where were you born? I mean, when, you know, what state uh, were you born? I was uh, born in Connecticut and um, and and traveled quite a bit throughout my whole life. But um, we, we lived throughout New England area uh, when I was growing up and in Germany for a couple of years. My father's job had us moving around quite a bit. But then when I joined the military, um, you know, I haven't been home since. And then uh, just 20 years around the world, I was living different places around the world. And now I live in Virginia. Okay. And uh, talking about different places, you know, what made you want to join the military? What made you want to be in a U.S. Navy SEAL? I understand you had different different types of positions in the military as well. Weren't you, uh, I believe you were a chaplain at some point, right? No, you know, uh, I was a, a kid who had a lot of energy, mm -hmm. but I wasn't doing the right thing all the time. I was getting in trouble here and there. And my father. Familiar. Was a, pardon me? Sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, I know. Miss, I was a misguided child. <laughs> <laughs> but my father had instilled a sense of patriotism in me as a young boy. And uh, I knew deep down inside I had to serve our country. I wanted to serve our country. When we were attacked in Pearl Harbor, my father was in high school, and he wow. quit high school to join the Navy. And his two brothers quit what they were doing to join the Army in the Army Air Corps and assisted quit to join the Navy. The whole family quit what they were doing to join our, our military. And that sense of patriotism was passed down to me. And I believe everyone's supposed to uh, support that country. And I know your beliefs on that as well. And so um, I didn't know anything about the SEAL teams. So what I did, I went to the, uh, the Marine Corps recruiter and not knowing a thing as a teenager, but this, I think I met the only Marine who wasn't squared away. He didn't have a nice crisp uniform and a good haircut and, and nice looking ribbons. He was a little different than what I thought a squared away Marine should be like. He wasn't squared away like the Marines I always pictured. So, so we so, missed uh, the opportunity. We missed an opportunity to have you in the Marine Corps. <laughs> oh, man. Well, well, what I did, Tank, I uh, became a corpsman in the Navy. That's and I was a corpsman with the Marines there you before go. I was a SEAL. And I loved working with the Marines. And being their corpsman was a right. great thing. But then, um, so I figured I'll go next door to the Navy, see what the Navy has to say. And they told me about SEAL training and BUDS. And my life, boom, there was a switch that went on and never turned off. That was the only thing I wanted in life, to be a SEAL. And that was my macro goal, to be a SEAL. I had to learn to swim. I had to learn to do thousands of push-ups a day and, and pull-ups and sit-ups and running. I had to learn to shoot and skydive. And I did all that. And the four years it took me to finally get orders to BUDS, every single day I trained to be a SEAL. I visualized it. I visualized how hard training was going to be. I learned all about diving before I went to SEAL training. 
I, I did a thousand over a thousand competitions in hopes to be faster and better prepared and better fit for SEAL training. And when I went to BUDS, every day was hard. But because of the visualization, every day the day would be over, it'd be a hard, hard day. I'd go back to the barracks, think that was hard. That was really hard, but not as hard as I anticipated because wow. I, I prepared myself. Awesome. There wasn't an easy day, but every day was a little easier than I thought it would be awesome. for preparing. That's 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 very awesome. I mean, that is phenomenal, man. And so you know, this is the uh, amazing things about um, a lot of folks like yourself, and Navy SEALs like yourself, um, that I have read books about and then I have read biographies about. I'm sure the listeners have done the same thing. Is you know, a lot of you guys have something very common. You guys actually went out and visualize it and prepare yourself to you know to become a Navy SEAL. You know, you didn't just get up and say, "Well, I'm just going to go to butts and I'm just going to," you know. You actually you know saw that it was going to be difficult and took the time to basically prepare yourself, prepare your body, prepare yourself mentally. What an amazing story. Um, so now you, you, you're a Navy SEAL. Well, yeah, tell us about that. Tell us about your experience as a Navy SEAL, uh, how many years and so forth, and you getting out, leaving the Navy SEAL, uh, the military, and getting to the civilian world, your transition process. How, how did that work out? Okay. And Tank, if I could go back a little bit, I mean, you're such a humble person. But I believe Marines have that same mentality. Sure. Definitely Marines and Army Rangers and Delta Force and Special Forces. And SEALs are getting a lot of credit with all the movies and books and everything out there. And SEALs, I do believe, are very special. Yes, but sir. I do believe the same with Marines and Rangers and Special Forces. Yes. I mean, we all have that powerful mindset. Yes, but thanks for saying that. And um, I think the credit goes uh, service-wide. But I love being a SEAL. I was at SEAL Team 1, SEAL Team 2, and SEAL Team 6. I was at the three SEAL teams I wanted to be, and I wanted to serve on the East Coast of the world, SEAL Team 2, the West Coast was SEAL Team 1, and then worldwide, SEAL Team 6. And I couldn't wait to get to SEAL Team 6. And I did everything for the SEALs. I, you know, I, my marriages failed. All I cared about was being a SEAL. And, um, and I loved every step of the way. Uh, when I got out, um, I got out right before 9-11. We were going after bin Laden. We were looking for him, but we weren't getting anywhere. And I went out and started working for the uh, different government agencies as a service contractor. So I was in the military over 21 years. And I've been doing the government work for over 21 years and still going to all the countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, all those places. And to tell you the truth, as a government contractor, you live a lot better over there in the military. You drive by and you see the poor military guys just like suffering, doing the work they're doing. And here we are in an air-conditioned vehicle a lot of times and in these terrible places. And we just live so much better than the military. You, you feel guilty being over there as a government guy after leaving the military. But I stayed in the same arena. And um, and I I... I love supporting our country. Now, one thing that might sound odd, but it comes from my heart, is I was in from 77 to 98. Wow. In the United States, those were easy years. We had our action here and there, but those were easy years compared to what this generation has been doing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and I feel like I had it too easy. And so I want to keep giving back. And I want to keep serving our country because I, I had it very easy. I'm in one piece. I mean, I was climbing Everest a couple of years ago and I'm and doing these double Ironmans and things like that. I'm doing things where other guys, you know, they happen to go to boot camp. They go to buds. They go overseas and terrible PTSD or losing an arm or a leg or an eye or something just because of the way the world is. It's such more, much more dangerous now than it was when I was in. And, uh, a lot of guys now have been at war their entire adult lives. And we were gone 300 days a year, usually. And we'd come home, people were injured, people were tired, people were getting divorced. Uh, the kids never knew who the dads were, you know. Then they'd get recalled, say, oops, I gotta, sorry, honey, I gotta go back on deployment, I'm getting recalled early. We thought we were pushing ourselves hard. It was nothing compared to the next generation where they had the same deployment cycle, but instead of going places training and a little bit of action here and there, they were going to war zones their whole time away. And 
and people I really, really look up to as SEALs, guys who had team one or two, and then they ended up at six. And when they were at six, there were some of the top SEALs there. Some of those guys are living in cars right now because of all the damage done to their soul and their psyche. Because if you're at war for 20 years and the things you see for 20 years are killing and deaths and you killing people and them killing your buddies and you getting harmed by them and having the nightmares and all that. I mean, our special forces, our special operations community uh, has a brunt of that load on their shoulders. And never in our country has anybody been at war for 20 years. So our SEALs, our Rangers, our Marines, special forces, special operations community has really taken a heavy load. And the damage is just ongoing. You know, they get out of the military. I had it easy. You know, I went to government work and it was no problem. These other guys now going from treatment facility, treatment facility, from treatment facility, still dealing with all the divorce issues and the health issues and trying to be around family and kids and shifting gears from a war zone to a peaceful community somewhere. It's a struggle for everybody. And um, I, I would like to tie in something. I knew I was coming on your show and I wanted to wear this shirt, Seal Kids. Yes, tell, tell us about that. Tell us about this. This is something that really means a lot to, to you. And I think a lot of our listeners need to support 110%. We here in Uncle Sam has got to chill. We care about the veteran community, especially, uh, you know, the 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 uh, Gold Star families as well. And uh, I think those those are taking the brunt of the sacrifice being made by our troops. Uh, and a lot of people just kind of forget, you know, what these families are going through. And I'm so glad to find that you're doing something amazing. So yes, please talk to us about it. And I want everybody to listen very carefully. Well, Tank, um, if somebody said, hey, Don, would you support a charity? If you could pick any charity, what would it be? It might not even be veterans or military. It'd probably be children because we all know when we raise our right hand, there's harm in our future, most likely. But kids, a lot of times, they don't even have a chance. And um, so I might put children above veterans, but veterans would be right there, just underneath probably. But then if given a chance to support two charities, it would be children and veterans. And then I was asked by the SEAL Kids community, hey, would you like to help us in any way? I was thinking, this is perfect. I would love to support SEAL Kids because now I'm, I'm helping to raise awareness, hopefully, hopefully raise some funds for SEALs families where the father may have been killed and the child, the children are uh, trying to be raised without the father and knowing what the mother has to deal with and all the hardships the children are probably a lot of them go through. And so, so I decided I'm going to, I'm going to put my efforts into supporting seal kids. And even before I was asked a friend of mine, his name is Don McFall. And Don McFall was with me at SEAL Team One. He was with me in Panama. He was a great guy. He was a hardcore warrior. And we all had so much respect for Don. And he was a good friend of mine. And, um, and Don McFall was on the runway in Panama. And he was shot and killed as he was saving SEAL lives, pulling SEALs off the runway during the invasion there. And I was on the water while that was happening on the canal. And he was up on the runway. And we lost four SEALs that night. But anyways, years later, I got a phone call saying, hey, you know, my sister is Don McFall's ex-wife. And she knew you and Don McFall were friends. And she would like to know if you would talk to Don McFall's daughter. And Don McFall's daughter was born after he was killed. I said, of course. I mean, Don McFall is a hero. They named an aircraft carrier after Don McFall for what he did on Panama. So I met with Don McFall's daughter, a young, beautiful girl, and she said, I just want to know my dad. My mother was eight months pregnant when he was killed. I never met my dad, and I knew you and he were friends. Can you just tell me about my dad? I never had a dad, and I just talked to a couple people who might know him, but I knew you served with him. And that, that glued everything. That's, I want to help the SEAL kids. And um, what SEAL Kids is doing now is, is fantastic, but they're expanding. They're going to be expanding to help children of the Army, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps. And they're going to they keep expanding, and they're doing wonderful things. 
and I, I'm so honored that I could help in some way to raise awareness, hopefully raise some funds for the families who've lost the seal of dad and help the kids. Wow, that's that's amazing, and uh, you you are so right, man. That, that that's a touching, you know, that, that's a very touching story, man. You know, to have a you know a child that you know would like to hear more about their their father, you know, and come from the point of view of somebody who has actually spent time with them. Um, you know, I, I don't know even words can describe that feeling and and those emotions. But um, guys, you guys are listening to Don Man, uh, U.S. Navy SEAL, also a uh, surviving man host. Uh, the TV show that we've been talking about. Uh, guys, go to Navy Seal. Uh, the website is called, so let me tell you guys right now, so you guys can go and donate right now. It is uh, NavySealKids.org. NavySealKids.org. And you can place a donation there. Um, there's various levels of donations, so whatever you can input. I know you guys are do, do an amazing job supporting these veteran organizations and nonprofits. Uh, but this is a great cause. Children do come first, especially our children, especially uh, from veteran families, especially Gold Star families. Man, uh, what a great cause, brother! Um, so tell us, uh, t- you know, tell us w- what's your next mission? What what is going on right now? Uh, I know you you're pretty busy and everything. Tell us. You, uh, recently, you were in several interviews. You've been on uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 news channels as well. Uh, tell us, tell us what's going on right now. You know. I- I've done shows with Fox, uh, especially Fox, uh, sometimes MSNBC or CNN. And last week I was on uh, Neil Cavuto's. He has two shows. I was on both of his shows last week. And it's basically to discuss, you know, a veteran's perspective on Kabul and what this administration is doing to our country. And um, I'm sickened by it, actually. And it hurts as a veteran to, to down talk your, your own president and your own military leaders, but um, we can't keep quiet anymore. I mean, this this administration is running our country into the ground. We have open borders. We don't know who's crossing our borders right now. We have all types of terrorists who can pl- come up into our country without without being stopped by any means. And now we have the Afghan refugees were being brought to our country. Uh, we're going to have 40,000 of them in the state where I live, unvetted, uh, no vaccines or anything like that. There, Some of them are on the terrorist watch list. But what we did to Afghanistan was a sin. It was a sin. The president signed a deal with the devil when he agreed to do anything with the Taliban. I have to say, sometimes you hear people from the administration and the left talk about, oh, we're going to, you know, the Taliban's going to do this for us. I mean, they're new and, new and improved Taliban. Well, I want to tell you my experience with the Taliban, with ISIS, with Al Qaeda. To me, it's all the same. It's all the same. All the same. They they change, you know, organizations all the time. Peep the guys in the Afghan army who supported us all these years. I mean, 19, 20, 24 year old kids. Who's to say they're not going to go to the Taliban now? The Taliban are the leaders there in that country. The Taliban just got a big shot in the arm with funding from Islamic groups around the world because not only did they beat Russia, now they just beat the big powerful United States of America and got an $85 billion gift on the way out of all our equipment and got a list of the names of the Afghan people who helped us while we're over there fighting this war. They couldn't, we've never given anything to the enemy. I don't think any country has ever given all that on a silver platter to the enemy. So now the experience I have, I went to the stadium in Afghanistan. And the stadium is where the beheadings, the tortures, the assassinations are, are, are done. And a pickup truck drove in and there's a crowd of 4,000, 5,000 people in the audience. And they're all drinking their tea, eating their peanuts, and they're watching, waiting for the atrocities to begin. So, the, and I have a video of this one. And I'd like to show it to people because it is how the Taliban, how how that terrorist mentality is. They had a seven-year-old boy. They held his arm to the ground. And the guy with the microphone was saying, yeah, this seven-year-old boy, he stole from a store. He stole bread. And wow. he's telling the crowd, this boy stole bread. And that's against our law, Sharia law, God's law. Wow. 
that's against our law. So he pulled up the pickup truck. He said this to the pickup truck. Pickup driver came up, rolled right over the boy's arm. The boy's screaming and yelling. He said, Sharia law, you cannot steal bread. So this boy is damaged for life. Then they pull out some people from pickup trucks, cut off the hands, cut off the feet, and then they walk around the streets holding the hands and feet up. Oh, oh my God. This is the beginning. This is the stages they go through, the amputations. And then they pull this old woman off a pickup truck and they put her on the ground and she is covered with her uh, clothing. And they shot her three times. They pulled her off. Then they did the executions. So I don't want to be too graphic, but it's important for people to know what these people are like. They're not like us. They're not like us. And then after all that's done, people come out with cloths and wipe up off the blood, off the ground. And then the soccer players come on and they're all playing soccer right there at the field. That's how they live. And unfortunately, now we have these people with $85 billion worth of our equipment who they'll, they're going to use that against us, against our friends, against our allies. They're going door to door and the executions are picking up speed. They're, they're not going to take this lightly. You know, they don't forgive. These people supported their enemy. Right. And they're, they're, this is what they say. They say the Taliban cannot change our ways. This is our way. This is the Taliban way until judgment day. Yep. And that is just what they believe is the right thing to do. So unless our president, our vice president, secretary of defense, secretary of state, chief of staff, unless they get a collective mindset transfer right. to say, Okay, let's forget about pushing wokeness. Let's forget about all this other stuff right, right now. Right. What we have to believe in is protecting our country, protecting our people, and focus on winning wars right. and not this other stuff that doesn't matter when it comes to defending our country, which is where I think they got the eye off the ball and went this other far left direction that has nothing to do with protecting our country. And that's why we're in trouble like we're in. We're in big trouble right now. Um, some some people I know there's there's efforts out there now to get rid of try to get impeachment going on, but then we have the vice president stepping up, right? And she doesn't have a background in any of this stuff. She was wow. she was selected for one reason and one reason only. We all know what that reason is, and she can't run our country either. We need people in those positions who can run our country, yes, sir. Left or right, it doesn't matter as long as they could run our country effectively and we don't have that we have biden who who should probably retire pretty quickly and just go live his life in a, a home somewhere right we have kamala and then we have nancy pelosi mm -hmm. i don't believe any of those people have the country's best interest in mind mm -hmm. they're not america first they're america last president trump had a plan that was working and all President Biden had to do is follow his plan, and we wouldn't be in this mess we're in. We wouldn't be in this mess. I mean, really, we could have got ROTC program. Okay, let's put together. How do we do this peaceful evacuation? How do we do an evacuation? Right. We would have had a better plan with them than what these people caused. So it's very, very disheartening, and I, I think about it 24 hours a day, basically, and what we did to our friends and allies who helped who helped us do what we did in helping this country. I mean, we weren't fighting the war the last 18 months. They were fighting their own war. We provided ground and air support and they were doing a better job. They weren't fantastic by any means, but they were a lot better than when we first got there. And we were pretty much hands off other than support. And it was all going well. And then overnight that all changed. We gave away the big air base, Bagram air base, which was a town in itself, really. We yep. freed all those people. They freed all the prisoners, mm -hmm. 5,000 terrible people running loose, gave them the $85 billion aid package and a list of all the names. Now we have something in our uh, at our fingertips that I have never heard anybody come up with a, a possible answer right now. It is a, a situation I don't think our country's ever been involved with something this bad since World War II. Yeah. No, I agree with you 100%. I personally, like I said, I don't have the little experience you have, but you know, I've been uh, studying this and watching this for a very long time. And, and, and like you said, it, 
doesn't make sense, right? So the only thing that makes sense to me is that the whole thing is made is is have been created by design. Basically, it is control chaos. So if you, you know it's tactical war, you know um, you know just the, the, the you know the rules of war warfare. Um, I just see I just see a chaos, but it's a control chaos by design. People, individuals have created this by design for whatever reason, whatever motives. Uh, but there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of bad people involved uh, doing bad things. And, um, and you know, it's just it just it's just ugly, very ugly because you never think, oh, this will ever happen. But when you get the right the, 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 the right bad people involved, you know, things really bad things happen. Like I'm going to I'm going to read something to you, uh, which is this is coming from the secretary uh, Cohen. He said Secretary Cohen said, I think the Taliban are going to need our help economically to be sure. But they may come under severe attack by Al Qaeda or ISIS K. They may need intelligence that they don't have. So we're going to give them intelligence now. And we may be able to provide them under certain conditions. So it may be ironic that the very people who have been fighting us will need us in order to stay safe and empower themselves. So this is coming from Secretary Cohen. So what do you think about that, man? Well, Tank, I think you just touched on a topic that I think we're going to hear more about. Uh, and I don't think anybody knows right now, but I agree with you. I don't see how any administration could have messed up something this badly unless there is some design, some purpose behind it other than what's obvious to us all. And the only thing I could even conceive of, and I heard uh, Oliver North, who I have such great respect for, talk about this a little bit. I heard General Keene reference this a little bit, who another person I have so much respect for. Biden has ties with China. Yes, sir. China, Iran, and Russia all have, um, uh, they have a reason to want to have control of Afghanistan. Yep. If Afghanistan, Iran, China, and Russia have an alliance, that could be the start of something really, really big. Really who big. knows the, the who knows what Biden's dealings are in China? Mm -hmm. We know his son had dealings. We know the Biden had dealings in China. Lithium. Who, who knows what kind of leverage China has against Biden? Right. Maybe we don't know who's setting. We don't know who writes the teleprompters that Biden's trying to read every night right. you know, or every week. Maybe we don't right. know who's even speaking for Biden. We don't know where his direction's coming from. Right. Maybe it's not coming from Susan Rice or right. former President Obama. Maybe it's coming from some some bigger source. Maybe China has leverage on what the president's policies are. Right. And if that was the case, and I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but that wouldn't surprise me. He's no. a corrupt. He's a corrupt politician. He's we know. I, we know. We know that. Um, you know, so, so I got because this this is getting me all. You know, and this is you know this is a very touchy subject, man. When it comes to especially veterans talking about this particular subject, um, so I mean, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. The man is reading a teleprompter, and some of the things that he's reading, sometimes he doesn't. He cannot even. So you know, he didn't write it because sometimes he has difficulties even reading the words so um you know and, and then he comes up with things like you know i was told not to say this or i was told you know not to answer any more questions who, who's telling you who you know um uh you know things like that that no other president has ever ever you know ever said in front of the public so there is somebody pulling the strings and and you have to be literally you have to have a pimple brain to not even to not even see that my my thing is, and and I'll let you keep running with this because this is very very important. Um, is nothing happens in D.C. without people knowing, and this is so obvious. And I will I will say that everybody, every politician, Republican or Democrat, knows exactly who's pulling the strings. I mean, I, I will I, you know you, they're there, they live there, they know rumor. Far and wide, so you know that's just my thoughts. Anyways, go go ahead, rock roll. You know, you know, Tank. I was talking to a, a general two days ago, and this general told me he said, without doubt, that election was stolen. President Trump oh, had seventy-five million votes uh, four years yeah. before. This time he had eighty-five million, more than any 
candidate ever in history and he lost. He said, without doubt, the Chinese have gotten into our election systems and changed the balloting system. And overnight, now Biden wins. Yes, sir. I, I believe that. I, I don't see how he could have won. Maybe that was in design because if we got a puppet as our leader, right, and we got Biden in there, and if Chinese were able to get Biden in there, and Chinese have more leverage on Biden now, now they can all actually, I can conceive that now they say, okay, we got you in as president. Now this is what you're going to do for us. Yes, I definitely can see that as a possibility. And that makes more sense to me than just the chaos we're seeing as a planned evacuation. Yes, sir. That, that couldn't have that been that bumbled. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, these, these are things are very important. But, you know, looking at something that I was thinking about this, you tell me what do you think, you know, looking at how uh, how many how many emotions are running right now, especially with our troops, especially with our veteran community. There has never been a time in history where we veterans can pull together something very amazing, very phenomenal to bring the veteran community onto three points to be successful in stopping or changing the way we do things. And, and I'm not talking about anything radical. I'm talking about bringing the veteran community to rise up, to rally up and to come together and support the troops as well as supporting those that, you, as you stated, have served a whole lifetime. Um, and these, you know, the, you know, emotions are really, really running high. So before I think, before you get, you know, somebody, you know, cause it's going to happen eventually, if this keeps continue, you're going to have a lone wolf somewhere, you know, just losing their mind and just saying, you know what, to hell with the system. I'm just going to do this. Um, and, and I would like to see personally, I would like to see leadership in the veteran community to, to bring all the veterans together, pull the pol politics aside, no Republican, no Democrat, but Hey guys, this got to stop. Right now, right here, let's come together. Let's go to D.C. Let's go to these capitals. You know, um, better community is very strong and very united on these subjects, especially what you're talking about. And they all feel the same way you're, you know, you're saying. What do, you, what do you think about that? You know, Tank, when you came in and when I came in and you serve with the people you serve with, I serve with the people I serve with, we rarely, rarely even brought up politics. Yep. We salute and shoot. Right? You do what you're told because you believed in our country, you believed in our leadership, you believed our president had our backs and our military leadership had our backs. And we, yes, we are going to lose people over there. We are going to get wounded. But we all agreed to that. That's what you do for your country. And you know this better than anybody. Um, that's what you do for your country. Now it's different. Now we have a military leadership that you they don't have your backs. You have a president who doesn't have your back. I would not want to send my son, if I had a son, off to join the military with during this leadership yes, we sir. have right now. Um, I, I don't believe the best intentions for our country is in their in their hands. They don't they don't believe leave no man behind. They they don't they don't believe in a long standing ethos. They believe in politics. And um, it's a very unsafe place to be. And you're you're a hundred percent pure patriot and veteran. So am I, and so are everybody we serve with. We don't believe in protesting and whining and complaining like the left often does. We believe in taking care of our country. But what you just brought out, maybe that's how we take care of our country. If we see this opposing force, which is the far left. And it's our president and vice president and chairman and SECDEV and SECDEV uh, state. If we see them as hurting our country, veterans in their hearts anyways, in their hearts are going to want to take a stand. And so many are going over there to Kabul right now just saying, right. let me do something to help. Right. Let me do anything to help. I know I'm not supposed to be going over there. Right. And now they go over there. They're going over there and they're being turned back from our State Department. It's really something unbelievable. If somebody wrote a book on this a year ago, I would have thrown the book out. I said, this is stupid. This would never, ever happen. Now right. it's hard to believe it's happening, and it's happening. And we're going to get repercussions of this for the rest of my life, I know. Yes, and uh, it's not going to be solved anytime soon. Our military, 
I think what has to happen is we got to get some real generals in charge. I mean, where's General Patton? Where, where are the great right. generals we used to have? Right. Now we have generals who are concerned about critical race theory and right. gay rights. Yeah, that's fine to talk about some other time, but not instead of taking care of our country. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's, not their, that's not why we put them in those positions. They're to protect us and keep us safe. And that's not what they're doing. They, they've got to be replaced. Right. And unless we have a president who's willing to do that, we still have the strongest military in the world. But that whole headshed of leadership doesn't have the will to put our military to use. And we are going to continue to lose. And and that's, that's, that is the foreseeable future while these people are doing what they're doing. You know, I was asked the other day, what do you think the leadership's going to do? What do you think the Taliban's going to do? What do you think ISIS-K and ISIS and Al-Qaeda will do? I think the answer is the same. The best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. So for our leadership, the past behavior is look what they just did. Look at all the failed policies. Look, always putting America last. That's past behavior of our leadership. For the Taliban, okay, what's the best indicator of their future behavior? Okay, it's their past behavior. Look what they've done to their own people, to our people. They behead people. They torture people. They kill people. We have the perfect storm now. We have our weak pathetic leadership who lies to our people tied in with this powerful now we just gave them an air force basically they're one of the strongest armies in the world that we just gave to them 98 billion dollars of weapons yep that's the perfect storm how else can we hurt our country i think our leadership just hurt our country more than any enemy has hurt us in many decades and we got they are, in my view the enemy of our country yes sir I couldn't I couldn't disagree with you more, and especially our open borders. Our, our borders are wide open. Uh, I have heard from individuals, uh, you know, working the Border Patrol. There's been, you know, several uh, situations where they have encountered Afghans coming through the borders. You know, and they're, you know, they're doing their, their, their investigation to find out who they are. Um, we, we, we just brought the, these refugees into the United States and some of them brought their, you know, nine, 10 year old wives you know, with them, you know, uh, you know, and they're asking the, the military is asking the government what to do in, in those cases. Like, uh, wouldn't you have known before we bet these people in? But the other thing is we left we left, left Americans behind and the Americans there's right now, supposedly there's Americans waiting at an airport. Those planes. What, what do you think about that? Leaving Americans behind Don? I mean, this is this is crazy, man. I mean, we, we are taught you never leave a person behind. You never leave an American behind. If they're wounded, you go back and grab them. If there's a person stranded, man or woman, you go back and grab them. But you never plan an evacuation where, well, we got 90% out. The other 10% will trust them to the Taliban. That's insanity. Insanity. Uh, yes, you mentioned the open borders. We are the most liberal country in the world as far as letting refugees in. We want immigrants. We want people from other countries in this country. We just want it done legally. We, we get all this criticism from our far left in other countries. Oh, you guys are so tough on borders. Why can't we get into Canada? Why can't Canadians come to us? Because the border is controlled by the Canadians up there. Our Mexican border is wide open. We want people coming across legally. They want people coming across illegally because the more people they can get in here that are immigrants, the better the voting base is going to be for them because they will require the left support. We will keep you people down. You people will need us. We're Democrats and we'll create all these social programs so you can have them. So, yeah, come on in. Come pouring in. We don't care if we get MS-13 in here. We don't care how many criminals we get. We don't care if COVID is on a rise and we're not testing you. And by the way, we are taking, we're going to do everything we can to take the guns away from you law-abiding American citizens, but we will give $85 billion worth of military equipment to our enemy. What kind of logic is that? But there's no logic to what's going on other than they want a big, 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 Massive immigration coming through illegally. It supports the Democrat data, uh, the demographics. They will eventually vote Democrat because they want the social programs Democrats say 
yes, you need us because you need the programs we're putting in place to keep you guys going. That's what we need. We're going to take away all your, wep all your weapons from you law-abiding citizens. Oh, yeah, but over here, we'll give the Taliban $85 billion worth. We'll give them an army. We'll give them an air force. None of it makes any sense. And all of it is America last. Victims, we are the victims now. We are last. The people causing us harm are being protected, and they're, they're the ones who our administration is catering to. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%, Don, and it's a fresh fresh air coming from somebody who has as much experience as you have being a Navy SEAL and seeing so much combat and done so many tours and coming from your knowledge, um, you know, it's a fresh air because, you know, I'm not crazy, right? You know, a, a lot of our veterans, you know, we kind of start, you know, kind of hesitating and doubting ourselves that, hey, are we seeing something that we're not, supposed? you know, are we, make, you know, just, you know, uh, I guess exaggerating what we're seeing? And it's not. It's actually real, and, and it's not a nightmare. It's you know, it's it's actually uh, the reality we're, we're looking at today. Um, but I said many, you know, many years ago as a communism survivor, uh, creating Uncle Sam has got a tool. And one of the reasons I created was to, you know, let people know it's going to get worse before it gets better. And it's as sad as it is, it's going to get worse because better because we have, we, we have not had anybody in uh, our government take accountability and responsibility for their actions. There's been a lot of crime committed and there's still people not not taking accountability. Now, now, if you're in the military and you do something that they don't like you, you, you I mean, easily in a matter of hours, your NJP put in the brig, uh, you know, lost the income, lost the rank and, you know, goodbye, throw away the key. But, um, you know, I'm going to give you another I mean, another topic. I mean, uh, we have Guantanamo base and we have had Guantanamo base for some time to place terrorists there. and. It has seen, you know, the past, you know, decade that we are, you know, uh, giving them, you know, a three meal, five star hotel. And then when something happens, we just take them out and, and put them as leaders on all these terrorist groups, ISIS, uh, okay, and, you know, Taliban, whatever. We just we just release them back into, you know, it's like they never lost a day. I don't know if we're there to train. Them. I'm not sure. You know, I'm just saying. But, you know. We're not, you know, what is the purpose of putting them in Guantanamo Base if we're just going to go ahead and back and release them back into, into their, you know, terrorist organizations? What, what do you think about that? One of the jobs I did as a security contractor overseas, and this is something we can talk about now more so than before, but it's open book information, so I'm not saying anything I shouldn't, is I worked at the black sites, and the black sites were the secret prisons we had when we first got the real bad terrorist, KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the guy who planned 9-11, Abu Zubaydah, um, the guy who bombed the USS Cole. We had the worst of the worst before they got to Gitmo. And we had the worst of the worst. We had them in these little barns, these little homes throughout all different places in the world. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11, who his fellow terrorists call him Mukhtar, the, the brain of the organization. He beat us on 9-11. He attacked us. And we lost 3,000 people that day. And he said in his own words, he said, we do not see life like you Americans. You're weak. And you guys go to the bargaining tables and you discuss things through debate and conversation. No, we don't see things like that. We read one book. It's called the Quran, and our interpretation is this. This is the way of life. No other variation than this. And when we go over there and we crucify people and we kill people, it's because they either convert to Islam or they get beheaded. That is our way. And then he was asked, what about all the women and children you guys are killing during these attacks, these suicide vest bombs? these roadside bombs, and his eyes lit up. He goes, oh, no, it's okay. It's okay to kill women and children if they're the infidel. If they're not Islamic, it's okay for us to kill women and children because they support the infidel. They support the military who's against us. So women and children, you kill them early, it's better. I said, what about the Muslims you're killing uh, during an attack? You kill Americans and Muslims. He said, well, that's okay if we kill a few Muslims. It's okay. He talked about cutting off Daniel Pearl's head. His eyes lit up. 
and they, they talked to, they asked him, okay, you, you cut off Daniel Pearl's head. Was it hard? He says, no, it wasn't hard until I got to his spine. I mean, they think differently than we do. And I know I'm saying some things that are very graphic and things, but I think it's only helpful to try to let Americans who don't know this stuff to know it in any way we can. I, I feel almost a responsibility, the things I've seen and know to say it, no matter how graphic it is, because that's what we're dealing with right now. Our media is our enemy as well. They they were very, very instrumental in having Donald Trump, President Trump, impeached for a phone call. And now we see Biden having talks on phone calls saying, OK, don't make it seem as bad as it is. He's talking to president of Afghanistan, President Ghani. Don't I don't want you to make it sound as bad as it is. And he does. He gets a pass for that. What's going to happen now? What's going to happen now? MSNBC, CNN, ABC, all the far left liberal stations, they're going to hide this story. They're not going to say the story. Actually, they will have everything on the news but Kabul in a little bit because Kabul makes their president look like a disaster. And they're going to hide this story. And every the only people who are going to be talking about this now, people like you, your podcast, people who do podcasts like you, and Fox. Nobody else will even talk about this story. They will talk about wearing masks, making our kids wear masks in elementary school and first grade, but letting thousands of people come through the border and bringing the Afghan refugees who aren't COVID tested or, or COVID vaccinated. They're going to talk about everything else but the disaster of what's going on in this country because what happened in Kabul will have an effect on our country. Yes, sir. But um, our media is aiding the decision makers who, who are making these things happen in our country. And I do believe we all have a responsibility like you do so well with this podcast and just being who you are when you speak. I think as veterans, we have a responsibility to to state the truth and what's really going on and not sugarcoat it and hide it and say the Taliban are new and different. They promise they're going to be different. They're going to promise they'll let the women uh, go to school. They'll promise they're going to be a more liberal of an organization. Well, we have to tell the Americans the truth of what's really going on and let them make the decision. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when you talk about, you know, the rawness of, of, you know, the reality, the reality of what we're dealing with, the any type of enemy we're dealing with, people need to know. And I think that, you know, a lot of, like you said, a lot of American citizens are kind of like, you know, they 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 have been, uh, you know, uh, sheltered, you know, to to believe that, you know, the world is so happy and fairy tales and unicorns. And, and it's not, you know, and we're dealing with a real enemy and we just gave them, you know, uh, billions of dollars in weaponry. Um, and, you know, we are, uh, our borders are on secure. So there's a lot of things going on. We got 9-11 coming up. Do you think, I mean, you know, just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like, this is, this is, it's not a matter of when, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's when, because everything that has happened it always happens, something happens in 9-11, you know, in Gazi, I mean, you, you name it, always something big, and really not, a, not in a good way, but something really bad. So I'm, I'm kind of praying and 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 we're all sitting back, but you know, 9-11 is around the corner right now, and we have this chaos uh happening uh around the world and, and inside our country. Uh so you know, I'm I'm telling my people, you know, be be prepared, be ready. Uh, but it's very important what you said about um, you know, how detailed you went into, and it's nothing to feel bad about because actually there's a lot of people that need to hear it to to see, you know, uh the, you know, before we leave the show. Because we only got a few minutes and I'm trying to cover so many things. You know, any ideas, any way do you think that we can get back and restore our country? Do you think there there's a possibility to do that and how we're going to do that? Do you think elections, you know, do you think the elections are, are going to be the same after, you know, 2020? Because personally, you know, as a communism survivor, once the election has been stolen once, they're just going to keep doing it. And, and it looks like, you know, they own the courts, they own the judges, you know, they're, yeah. how many people involved. What do you think is going to happen? Well, we have the Senate and, you know, um, we have the midterm elections coming up and hopefully, hopefully everybody's who 
doesn't know the truth already is going to see what this administration's doing. And they, if they vote left, I think they're going to start voting for the person who, who's more focused on taking care of Americans and our country. And if they do that, they're most likely going to switch voting from Democrat to, to Republican. And I'm not trying to sound political. It's just you're pro-America or you're, you're against America. And if you, if you happen to hate our country, keep voting left because you're going to get the policies that are going to go against our country. I don't understand. If people don't like our country so much, they can leave. They don't have to stay here. The reason they don't leave is the best country on the planet still. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. Right. And, and I don't know why they they don't see that. Why keep degrading our country and changing it for the worse? Now, I understand why President Biden came in and he turned around every one of po the pro policies President Trump put in place is because he was voted in to be the anti-Trump. So he just did what his political advisor said. OK, everything Trump did, undo it. Yeah, it'll make our country weaker. It'll make it unsafe. Everything, but it's undoing Trump's policies, and that's going to make you stand out. The reason he did this big debacle in Afghanistan, of course, is so he can walk around and say, look, 9-11, I can celebrate the end of the war. Of four presidents, I am the president who ended this war. Well, yeah, they can brag about how many people they evacuated. History's not going to remember the number of people. History's going to remember the number of people we left behind and the disaster this world is in now because of what Biden did. Amen. We have lost our standing in this world. The whole world order is tipped upside down now. Yeah, We're not right. looked at as a world leader. We're not looked at as a country people can trust. No. I mean, it, it's really – we're looked at as pathetic, weak nation now. And and that's that's the, the sad reality of this. Our allies are we, – we turn our backs on our allies. I mean, the French – the French was going back into the city and, and, and getting their own people. You know, every every other country was going back inside that city and getting their own people. And, and here uh, we are with the strongest military in the world not being utilized. Yep. Oh, no, I can't send our people back in there. Mm -hmm. We are going to end up going back there or we're or they're going to have to hide the news and, and not show the atrocities going on. The door to door knockings and the executions taking place right now as we speak right. are going on. And the news will try to hide that as much as they can, but it's going to come out thanks to Fox and people like that. And you, the, the news is going to come out. It's going to come out, not in the way it should, because every American should hear it. A lot of Americans are opposed to watching news. They think it's right wing radical, but it's not right wing radical. It's what's happening in the world and it's reporting what's happening in the world. And if they could choose to put their head in the sand and ignore it, that just everybody who does that makes our country weaker and weaker and weaker. Uh, exactly, sir. I posted, I posted this the other day. I said, you know, uh, when only one viewpoint is, uh, you know, is um, allowed and everybody else's points is censored, uh, a country that has that type of system will never survive. You know, and, uh, you know, you can never you can never unite uh, uh, citizens together if only one view viewpoint is allowed. And that's exactly what they've been doing. Um, we will continue to be censored. I mean, I, I lost 2.5. I lost millions of pa Facebook pages with millions of followers, and I restart them over and over again. Finally, they went in and, and, and blacklisted me. But you're right. I mean, you know, this is what I do. Every, it, this is what I've been doing since 2009, man. Just, you know, sharing sharing the message that needs to be heard and, and people bringing people like yourself um, to share that message and, uh, you know, and getting more people to – to, to understand it and to be educate, you know, educate a lot of folks. We have had so many, uh, something very important you mentioned about uh, if you had a son today and he was asking you to join the military. Um, one thing that I've taken, taken much pride is how many, how many Marines, how many young Marines, how many uh, sailors, you know, uh, airmen, you know, Coast Guard have joined the military because of Uncle Sam has got a children. And now today, man, uh, I feel the same way you do. They 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 message me and they they ask me, hey, Tank, you know, I've been following you a long time. My dad joined the military, too. You know, what do you think? I'm thinking about joining the Marines. I'm thinking about joining this. And I'm telling them, it's like, this is not a good time. You know, it's, it's not a good time for, you know, because of this country very much and our, our, our troops very much. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, Don, we are at the end of this show, and and brother, I would love to have you back anytime you have some time because 
this has been a great show. Time has uh, run run by us. We could probably talk about so many things. Um, uh, you know, and, and just you know, just how good to have a great conversation. But on this last end of our show, tell us about you know what where you want our listeners and our readers to follow you and support you and support what you're doing. Okay, once again, I'm gonna put the websites up um and let them know where, where to do that as well. Well, thank you, Tank. And I have great respect and admiration for all you do for our country and for our veterans and our community, because you're putting the word out there. And you you don't have a political agenda. Um, I you know I'm an author and I put on sporting events and things. But the thing that I'm doing that's most important right now is supporting SEAL kids. And um, I think that's a, a wonderful charity. There are a lot of great charities out there. But the thing I'm focusing on right now is supporting the kids and the SEAL families who lost their dads. And um, and there are SEAL kids. There's websites uh, you can go to support SEAL kids. And I do hope you'll consider looking at supporting SEAL kids. And um, and I want to thank you, Tank, for having me on. It's, it's a great pleasure uh, to, to see you and to talk to you again. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, it's an honor. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to talking to you again, man. Hopefully I get up there in Virginia, man, or bring you some patent series, put it in your hands and let's do some hog hunting and let's get after it, man. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, that I'm, I'm looking forward to, it, man. That's going to be super excited, man. So and definitely, you know, we, we got a couple of projects we, we talked about yesterday and um, I'm sure we we will have you back here again and to to really push those those projects and to, to get people involved. Thanks, Tank. Thank you very much, sir. You have a wonderful day. And, uh, you know, God bless America. God bless America, Tank. Thank you. All right, guys, that's the end of the show. Thank you so much. Make sure you share this video far and wide. We will bring U.S. Navy SEAL Don Man back here on this show once again. And please go to that website, okay, uh, NavySEALKids.org, and support it any way you can. Um, you know, and anything, anything you can support, you know, I know some of you guys got some big bank, so make sure you guys throw some big money there. Okay. You are helping a family. You're helping these kids, you know, get some education, get college, get money for, the, you know, their future. Uh, and, and that's, that is our job. If our government cannot do, take care of veterans, we will. That's how we do it. All right. Simplify, do or die. God bless America. Hoorah.